Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me first state that I just read that the um, Iowa uh, Democratic Party is meeting with the candidates like right now. So um, if people are checking their phones, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to think that I'm not that interesting. It's just there are more important things happening in the world right now. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to present some research that combines uh, a couple of different projects that I've been working on, two of which are published. So I'm going to use those as sort of a setup to some new ideas that I'm working on. So I've, this is not the title you saw before because I'm incorporating a bunch of stuff and this is um, tentatively called College the Great Unequalizer, Racial Differences in Returns to Educational Credentials. Um, so just uh, sorry for these slides too because this is not Adobe and for some reason when it's supposed to just uh, move to the next thing that's not um, grayed out, it's now showing it as if it's a new slide, so it's not visually pleasing. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, as Janet mentioned, um, I'm going to first talk a, just a little bit about the results from the Social Forces paper as a setup for why I'm doing what I'm doing now. And everything that I'm talking about incorporates these ideas from the Sociological Science paper because this is um, sort of... Uh, I guess you might say the gold standard for right now, at least for figuring out how to signal race and um, uh, in experiments, both field and survey. And a lot of what I'll be talking today is drawing on um, this third paper that I'm working on right now. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the survey experiment stuff totally ready to go, so I'm not gonna talk about it, but I'm, I'm happy to talk with people about it later. So um, in 1979, uh, Randall Collins wrote, education is the most important determinant yet discovered of how far one will go in today's world. And I've always sort of been obsessed with this statement since I read it because um, I think particularly in our society, there's a notion to agree with this statement while also understanding that there are other things going on um, that we all accept. Obviously we wouldn't be here if we didn't accept on some level that education is important, um, but we have to think about how we might reconcile this statement with the racial economic inequality that we know exists and other forms of inequality as well. Um, in terms of uh, racial inequality in the US, just to give you a little bit of a background here, um, the most recent data on uh, using secondary data looking at racial wage differences among bachelor's degree holders suggests that black men earn about 70 to 80% of the wages that white men earn and black women earn about 80 to 90 percent of the wages that white women earn. Um, some research suggests that this inequality is the largest among, college ed among the college educated, particularly for men. And all of this, um, uh, all of the things that have happened during educational attainment expansion creates sort of a puzzle because on the one hand, gender wage gaps have decreased over the last couple of decades at the same time that racial wage gaps have increased. Um, so hopefully you can see this okay, but this is from a recent paper um, from uh, a, a, some researchers working at uh, one of the Federal Reserve Banks and using secondary data, what they're trying to do here is decompose these racial wage gaps. And on the left, we've got men and you can see that um, a significant portion of this gap is coming from the dark blue, or, or sorry, the, the medium blue, I guess you could say, which is education, the lighter blue, which is industry and occupation, and then the red, which is unexplained. You can also see that these gaps are smaller for women, but still the vast majority of this gap is coming from those three categories. So. I suggest you could think about this as sort of two leading explanations if you are operating in this world that I operate in where you're thinking about racial discrimination and you're thinking about educational credentials. One is that these are differences in human capital. Um, and the second is that, that unexplained, at least at some level, is capturing racial discrimination. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> I don't like that, this, the way I have to do these slides. Um, so in terms of differences in human capital, those, those variables that they're capturing um, are capturing differences in uh, educational attainment. But you could also think about educational attainment within um, levels of attainment, such as the types of degrees that people get or the college selectivity of those degrees. Um, there's other things that are tied in in different ways to occupation and industry. 
um, uh, such as this last uh, this last point about experiences, so um, the internships that people get, their choice of major or field of study. Um, so there's a lot of things I think that are connected back to the education system that even if it's not the way that um, uh, researchers who do secondary data analysis might think of, uh, might label it as education, it still sort of feeds back into that loop. So if we look at these racial differences over time in white-black uh, degree attainment, they are relatively stable since um, the 1970s. So what I've charted here is um, from NCES, the uh, percentage of people 25 to 29 years old with a bachelor's degree or greater. Um, there's a white line, which is, um, I'm sorry, the, the red line captures the percentage of whites with a uh, BA or greater, and the green line uh, captures the percentage of blacks with a BA or greater. You can see that if we look at, um, although everybody is increasing in terms, of, both groups are increasing in terms of the percentage of people receiving bachelor's degrees or greater, the gap has stayed relatively stable, um, uh, if not increased somewhat in the last couple of decades. Um, so one way, another way you could slice this is thinking about uh, everyone is, that's getting a bachelor's degree isn't getting the same kind of bachelor's degree. Um, and you could think about this in terms of college selectivity. So we know from administrative data that black students only make up about four to six percent of student body at the highest um, tiers of selectivity. So the real question then is, does college selectivity matter? Which I'm assuming if you're sitting in this room, you really believe it does. <laughs> but believe it or not, there are people that argue that it doesn't. So there's a lot of um, research that's been published in the, in the last couple of decades that finds that people who attend more selective institutions are more likely to graduate, they're more likely to attend grad school, and they're more likely to earn higher wages. However, there are others, um, economists in particular, that argue that once you adjust for selection, people's ability and motivation and, um, to go to the highest tiers of um, selective institutions, uh, the actual effect of selectivity is, is eliminated. It's washed out. This is all just a selection effect. Um, so when I started embarking on this line of research, I was interested in this from these sort of com uh, competing angles of is this about um, sorry is this about um, these racial differences is it about differences in human capital um, which I was really interested in le levels of college selectivity given that uh, African American students are much less likely to go to the higher tiers of, of institutions is it about racial discrimination or is there some mechanism of both happening in the market um, so I won't spend too much time talking about this but you know, I do audit studies, and I'm sure you have some, at this point, hopefully some knowledge of what they are, essentially just an experiment where you're trying to adjudicate issues um, that might be difficult to adjudicate with secondary data. It allows you to manipulate um, uh, the characteristics of the individuals that are being reviewed by employers or real estate agents or whomever might be uh, you might be interested to study. So in terms of the first question, what I found in the social forces paper is that um, the applicants who went to less selective schools were much less likely to get callbacked by employers than the applicants who went to the elite schools. Probably not a big shock. I also found that um, in terms of the posted salary ranges of the jobs that I was applying for, um, you can see on this, oops, you can see on this um, second uh, row that individuals who um, went to the elite schools were getting callbacks for jobs with higher starting salaries across the board. Um, the other part of this, the racial discrimination part, um, I, I want to first sort of define racial discrimination using this um, uh, definition that comes from a book that uh, a bunch of researchers put out through the National Academies of Science. Um, it's actually a really good book if you're interested in racial discrimination. Um, it's a little, it's getting a little old now, but they came up with this definition trying to separate the idea of what social scientists think of as racial discrimination versus what are the legal definitions of racial discrimination. And they suggest that it's differential treatment on the basis of race that disadvantages a racial group or treatment on the basis of in, uh, inadequately justified factors other than race that disadvantages the racial group. Um, so the idea here is that 
given a field experiment where we're essentially controlling for everything else, when we send a white applicant and a black applicant in to see how they do, there's no other explanation than racial discrimination. That's the point of the audit studies. So there's different ways of thinking about this in terms of what could be going through the employer's minds when they make these decisions. Um, I'll, if anybody wants to talk about this more in terms of the survey experiment, that's where I'm trying to get into the mechanisms of this and what's actually happening. Uh, it's really, people tried some ways to do this with, field, with audit studies, but it's actually really difficult to sort of adjudicate, at least to um, adjudicate this in a way where it's really believable, I think. So in terms of the racial discrimination, I found that um, uh, blacks, regardless of which type of credential they had, were less likely to get called back from the employers. And then um, although uh, you can see that both um, whites and blacks benefit from having an elite degree, um, they were, uh, if you compare less selective to elite, there's, they're more likely to get called back if they're moving, if they have the elite degree. Um, Blacks with an elite degree uh, were only as likely, essentially, as whites with a less selective degree to get a call back. Um, so in terms of those research questions from that social forces paper, uh, essentially, are there differences in human capital? Yes. And then didn't those differences have an effect? Yes. Um, but racial discrimination is occurring simultaneously. So I started thinking about what about the people who pursue higher education but don't attain a bachelor's degree? This is a growing percentage of um, people attending college or attending two-year uh, two -year degrees, um, going to for-profit schools, um, picking up these certificates that uh, a lot of these for-profits are touting as sort of a bridge credential to a bachelor's degree that you can complete online in a quick, um, sometimes they say in a summer, but... Uh, I'm not sure you can actually do that. Well, um, but then I started thinking about what is this idea of college selectivity for a two-year degree? And so I actually started with survey experiments first, trying to figure out um, how people viewed different two-year degrees and whether anything mattered other than um, maybe if it's a local school that they would actually know. Um, and pretty quickly realized that essentially selectivity at the two-year level operates in sort of an opposite way than it does at the four-year level in that most people can't distinguish two-year degrees, but they certainly know what uh, the University of Phoenix and Strayer University and other for-profit schools are and seem to have negative views of those schools. So um, in thinking about this, I want to set up um, <laughs> what's actually going on um, in the real world in terms of these two-year uh, two degrees. So in this prevailing college for all ethos that um, we're now in this, um, in the middle of, there's been massive increases in the numbers of both students and institutions, um, including student enrollment at two-year colleges increasing about 30% from 2000 to 2010, uh, and for-profit colleges of all types uh, account for about 40% of all student enrollment growth in a 15-year period beginning in 2000. So this is a massive expansion of the higher education system that's happened relatively quickly um, and up until, you know, the, the, the last half decade or so with sort of minimal oversight and, and any sort of breaks on this system. So 70% of, um, this is data from the NCES, 70% of high school graduates enroll in some sort of post-secondary institution. About a third of those are enrolling at least to start in a two-year college. That means uh, as of about 2018, we had about 8 million students enrolled in two-year colleges. And 15% of two-year students are uh, African-American versus about 6% of four-year students. So whether it's advertising, whether it's opportunity, um, whether it's some version of both that incorporates um, predatory elements and um, opportunistic elements. Um, these colleges are targeting African-American students and receiving African-American students enrolled in their schools at higher rates than four-year colleges are. So I think this is sort of a, a very interesting area to think about racial discrimination and inequality. Um, and a lot of people have done different things, but. I started thinking about, okay, so what's the white-black gap look like for these associate degrees? 
And essentially, it's very close to parity that um, there's been some, um, some increased enrollment um, and attainment of these degrees by African-American students in the last 15 or so years. So that that white-black gap, that same white-black gap that was almost two, the difference between the percentage of whites and blacks with um, bachelor's degrees, it's basically just about 1.1 1 .1, uh, for associate degrees. When we think about for-profit colleges specifically, because that's what I want to focus this idea of selectivity on, about one in five black men and one in five black women in higher ed period are enrolled at higher ed, or enrolled at for-profit colleges. Um, some people suggest that these are predatory. Um, the three-year cohort default rates, so that means people that default on their loans within three years of, of um, terminating their uh, enrollment, either by receiving a degree or just stopping uh, to attend college and they have to start paying their loan back, loans back. At the peak, for-profits had a um, default rate of 25% versus 11% for public. That was around the, uh, the height of the recession. Currently, it's about 15% for for-profit versus 9% for public institutions. And um, Dave Deming, who does a lot of work on um, for-profits, has found that about half of all student loan defaults in the last, um, I'm sorry, it's been a little while now, but in the, in the first decade of this expansion at least, um, were coming from for-profit institutions. Now, thinking about the costs, um, because some might think, well, it's cheaper, so um, this is actually not as big of a deal. Well, it's not. Two-year for-profit degree costs about $14,864 in tuition and fees per year uh, versus $3,900 in-state for a two-year public or $7,800 out-of-state. Um, and then essentially what you're seeing is uh, you could attend a four-year public out-of-state school for just, um, I don't know, about 25% more or so than what it costs to go uh, to um, pay for a two-year for-profit. So these are not cheap. They're significantly more expensive than their counterparts. So then again, my, my, my real question here is getting at this idea of the stigmatization of for-profit schools. We, we know, we've seen it, that policymakers have called these um, institutions out. The media has written tons of reports about the predatory nature of them, um, and there's been sort of a, a, um, a public opinion that these, the, that these are bad, right? But that doesn't tell us much about what employers are actually thinking of the degrees, right? Because if, um, if part of the problem is that kids enroll and they don't finish, um, that's a separate problem than if they finish, employers don't value the degrees at all. Because at that point, it doesn't matter if you enroll and finish anymore. <laughs> There was no point to it to begin with. Um, so I want to just draw a little bit of, upon the secondary data on this question. So returns to two-year degrees, um, basically it's all over the place. Uh, some have found that the returns to a for-profit degree are equal to a not-for-profit degree. Some have found that for prof, uh, what you get from going to a for-profit is better than if you don't have a college degree. Um, and then uh, a, a newer paper finds that essentially for-profit is about equal to not having a college degree, um, which is obviously worse than having a not-for-profit degree. Um, there have been some experimental studies on this. Um, they each have their own relatively serious flaws that I'm happy to talk about more, but most of them relate to the ways that race is used and recorded in these. Um, Dave Deming's uh, field experiment found that for-profit degrees were worse than no college um, and not-for-profit was better than both. Um, Ross Darolia and colleagues found that for-profit, not-for-profit, and no college were all about equal. Um, it's interesting to note that both of those uh, audits were in the field at the same time, um, and yet they found very different findings. And then Nicole Detterding and David Padula found that for-profit, not-for-profit, and then simply making up a fake college that didn't really exist, were all about equal. So there's some questions, I think, some serious questions here about whether or not employers can distinguish any of this, if they care, if it matters by race. Um, and so that's what I'm interested in this project, um, thinking about uh, racial differences, um, oh, I'm sorry, 
Uh, and then th these last two um, also looked at racial differences. Uh, Dave Deming's project found that they were mostly negative, although insignificant. Um, part of this problem is that they had a mistake with their um, RAs, and so uh, they had used initials instead of full names when they put all the data together, and they could not separate African American and Hispanic names in the end. So the paper is about white versus non white instead of white versus black versus Hispanic. Um, be careful with your RAs, I guess. <laughs> Give them very explicit instructions on what to do. Um, and it, apparently, this is not recoverable. We've, we've talked about it in great detail. Raj Darulia found no differences. Um, their flaw, I would argue, is that they were trying to avoid uh, overtly black names. And so instead of something like Lamar, uh, da Daquan Washington, they would use something like Josh Washington, which in my research I found most people do not think Josh Washington is black. So you're not look, really looking at racial differences. Okay, so this returns to the same research questions essentially I had before with a, a little bit of a different spin. So does college selectivity matter in the labor market? In this case, we're actually sort of thinking about um, the, the negative selectivity perhaps of for-profit, um, the for-profit names. And then are racial differences in labor market outcomes driven by differences in college selectivity, racial discrimination, or both? So I set up multiple scenarios in um, this experiment. Um, the first is that someone says they've earned an associate degree at a for-profit institution. Um, this is uh, University of Phoenix or Strayer University. Um, I specifically am trying to avoid the online versions. These are in locations where they actually have physical campuses. I try to make that as clear as possible on the materials that this is not the online version because what I'm interested in is not how the online part itself might convey something different, but the actual name, given that it's still a physical building that you went to school for, um, that we're trying to avoid employers thinking that, you know, this is a complete sham, <laughs> that it's something that still is like school at another two-year place. It just has this different name that they know. In the second scenario, they list that they've earned an associate degree at a not-for-profit institution, and these are all always local as well, just in case someone knows, you know, oh, the kids that come out of Bronx Community College, they really knew how to teach them, or they don't. <laughs> um, and then another option here are these bridge certificates. So I was curious how um, essentially earning another, uh, another credential that might not be completely applicable but shows that you're still committed to earning an education and, and still working on your education um, might increase your odds because it gives you something over someone else, essentially. Um, whether you know, that's actually valuable to, your, to the job you're applying for or not <coughs> may or may not be true, um, but still it, it shows that you're committed to education. Um, and these come from the University of Phoenix online. Um, these are, this is the main um, <coughs> source of these certificates. I'm happy to talk about it more, but essentially they're marketed, like I said, as these bridge credentials that are getting kids to, you know, are you, are you not happy with where you are right now? Do you not have time to go back and get a four-year degree? You can get this certificate and it's like um, a certificate with a focus in marketing or business management. There's a handful of things that they do. And then of course, um, this is uh, uh, across white and black applicants, male and female. So, um, Basic setup here, apply to, five, uh, apply to jobs in five U.S. cities, post it on the National Job Search website. Um, I have to create the candidates. Um, if, I don't know if anybody here in the room has done this, but this is a super labor intensive, really annoying process that um, uh, I'm, I'm constantly searching for more automated ways to do this. Um, but I've, I've got some that, that speed it up, but essentially you've got to create the resumes, the cover letters. You have to have a real address, a phone number, email, voicemail. Um, some tools since I started this have made this much easier. Um, Google Voice does the, the, you can do the transcription now from the voicemail so no one has to physically listen to them. But um, then you want to match the candidate profiles in some way that makes sense because obviously you don't just send a person with resume A with one name and then resume A with a different name to the same job because that looks pretty suspicious. So they're counterbalanced in a way where it's not the exact same resume as applying to each job, but um, there's equal opportunity for it to be a white or a black candidate. 
um, to be University of Phoenix or um, the local two-year school. And then, of course, um, you have to record the responses that you get from employers that sometimes come by email, but usually just by phone. Um, as was mentioned at the beginning, I spent a lot of time trying to understand how people um, uh, interpret these signals that we send. There wasn't a whole lot of real scientific work on this before I started working on this. Um, and so it's a long, complicated process that I've, that, of where I've gotten, but what I can show you is that um, when you test these in a survey experimental setting, um, the vast majority of people are actually recognizing the names that I use as the race that, as it's intended. Um, there are other problems here that are tied to social class, and I've, I have some other papers that address these issues, but regardless, it's what we have right now. And I'm, again, I'm really happy to say that's one of my bread and butter areas that um, I'm, more, I'm happy to talk about more as well, but this is, um, this is where we're at for now. So the cities that I use um, were Chicago, Houston, New York, Phoenix, and San Diego, um, partially driven by the availability of jobs at the time um, and uh, the use of the, the job boards in these cities. Some, it's strange, but some cities have more or less active um, that don't necessarily uh, align with the population size. For instance, San Francisco on the website that I use, San Francisco is horribly overrun with just junk ads um, for people, essentially, you know, those ads that you see that are like, um, be my real estate assistant and make $200,000 next year, right? And you're like, that's not a real job. <laughs> I, for some reason, some cities are worse at filtering these, and so it's a little bit easier to just make some choices on that basis. But um, I limited the jobs that I was applying to to those that said they required a two-year degree. Um, that were posted in the last two weeks and they were in 50, within 50 miles of the city because the cover letters are tailored to saying, you know, I just graduated and, um, or I'm about to graduate and I'm, I'm looking for a job locally. The jobs were ones that were focused on customer service, sales, and administrative assistant job. I wasn't really going for jobs that required specialized two-year degrees. <clears throat> and then um, the outcome is simply whether the employee responds to ask um, if you're interested in coming in for an interview, either uh, in person or by phone, or if they request more information um, in cases that, as as as, as much as we can tell, are not simply sent out to every applicant. It's not just a form letter, it's actually, we are specifically interested in you in this case. In total, I applied for um, uh, nearly 3,900 jobs and there's two applicants per job. Yes, I know, I've probably applied to more jobs in my life than anyone on, that's ever lived on this earth. <laughs> it's insane. Uh, yeah. So what uh, is the set of your schools and the majors? Oh, um, I don't have it in here. Let's see. So the schools are all um, dependent on the city. Um, so the four, pro the only four profits are University of Phoenix and Strayer, and that depends on which one has a brick and mortar in the city. Um, the two-year universities, there are. I think three options per um, city um, that are simply pu public two-year general associate degree. So they're not specialized in a bit like a barber college or whatever. Um, and I, I picked multiple ones for each city just in case there was something that I didn't know, like this particular institution is really seen as a dump or something, right? And the employers know that that is um, not a place they want to hire people from. I didn't find any particular effects of any, any particular city. Um, the actual major for the students is always um, uh, whatever sort of generic business major they have. So it may be um, like a business, uh, like sometimes it's just sort of like general business degree, associate's degree. Sometimes it's um, manage, I think it's business management. Um, there are a couple of other options that are like marketing when they have it. Um, I'll have to look. I may have it in the appendix. I'm not sure. Yes. Um, 
Uh, how representative are Strayer and University of Phoenix of the for-profit system? Is it the case that they're like kind of in the middle of the distribution? You might worry, these are well known even within that system. Yeah. I mean, so essentially there are, they are the big ones. So in terms of the percentages of, of students that are out there, a lot of that is driven by the online side of it rather than the, the brick and mortar side of it. So there is a, it's, it's not a clean signal in that, in those cases, right? Where as much as I'm trying to capitalize on the, you already know this, obviously on some level, there's certainly gonna be people that don't read it closely enough to see that it's brick and mortar or don't care, right? But I, I, in terms of like, is this a good signal of what for profits? Um, I can't fully answer that because I don't have data on the other ones. Um, I'm trying to recall, I, I believe at least one of these other papers I talked about had a larger universe and essentially, if I recall correctly, didn't find huge differences. But I do think that this is part of the, uh, these papers are all have very disparate findings when they say for profit versus no college degree at all or for profit versus not for profit is coming from the universe, their selection of what the signals are. And so, you know, in terms of being generalizable to for profits, maybe it's more accurate for this to be a piece on um, the well known names, you know, the heavy hitters and what they are doing. I do, I sort of, I'll return to that a little bit in the discussion of why I'm particularly stray or why was I interested. Okay, so um, I won't spend too much time on this, but I'm um, happy to hear other thoughts on this. When I sat down and thought about what are the potential, you know, from, from what we know in the literature and what we've, what I found in other types of field experiments, what are the potential um, outcomes here in terms of the degrees themselves. So I label the first uh, the first hypothesis as just stigma, that not-for-profit, people with a not-for-profit associate degree are, are gonna get more callbacks than those at for-profit, regardless of race. The second is that it could just be that racial discrimination happens, that for white associate degree holders, um, uh, they'll get more callbacks than black associate degree holders and the actual dimension of selectivity, the for-profit versus not-for-profit doesn't matter. Um, and then the, the C and D are about blacks or whites being treated differently on the basis of for-profit or not. That um, you can imagine a scenario where um, African-Americans get fewer callbacks when they have a for-profit degree because maybe that stands out more on their resume rather than whites do, right? That whites, it's like, it's an associate's degree, that's all we're looking for. Whereas employers may scrutinize um, the resume of the African-Americans more closely and um, or essentially penalize them for having the for-profit in a way they don't the whites. The reverse could be true, right? That an employer could say, why is this white guy, why'd he get a degree from Strayer? Or, or University of Phoenix and scrutinize those resumes more. And then finally, um, my favorite titled hypothesis, the worker bees hypothesis, hypothesis is that um, employers don't care, right? That they, they simply don't care. And if you've got a degree, um, that's fine. That was where their bar was. And they also don't care if you're white or black. Very unlikely, but possible. Okay. So here's what I find in terms of just the degrees. So um, employers were slightly more likely to call back those with not-for-profit associate degrees than for-profit associate degrees, about 11.3% rate versus 8.5. They also were slightly more likely to call back whites compared to blacks at the aggregate, 11.0 um, 11 to 8.8. .8. When we look at the difference um, by for-profit, not-for-profit, and race, what I find is that essentially the only category that um, is different than the others are African-Americans with the for-profit associate degrees. That they're getting penalized for having that for-profit degree and receiving significantly lower callbacks than if they had a not-for-profit degree or if they were white and had either degree. The second set of hypotheses I'm interested in is what happens with the certificates? Um, and here I come up with three hypotheses that there could be what I call signal boost, 
that having a certificate is better than not. Uh, you're showing that you're committed to education, you've done something else, you've got a leg up on other people with this piece of paper. There's signal saturation that at this level, it doesn't matter and that you got this extra thing, they don't care, they don't know what it is, whatever, it's equal. And then there's signal degradation where actually having a, a certificate is worse than not because maybe it shows that you were desperate and things weren't working out for you, so you tried to get this other degree and they're like, I don't know what this is, University of Phoenix Online garbage. Yes, Dalton. Is this, sorry if you mentioned this, but this is in addition to the associates? Yes, oh. so this is on top of, right? So the question is, is that sort of boosting the signal doing nothing or degrading what you've already done. The signal in the same institution, so if they have a certificate, would be at a not-for-profit because that's where their degree is. No, so, so all the certi a certificate at a not-for-profit, at a for-profit, and a degree at a not-for-profit. Yes. Um, so that's the, that's the only wrinkle here is that these certificates are only from, this, this is essentially a money-making grab from the for-profits. And they're only they're they're almost exclusively at least when I did this online, and for profits. So the only way it made sense was to keep that the same regardless of where the degree was, right? So that's why you could imagine the signal degradation could actually happen for students who had a not for profit degree, and they're like, why did you go back and do this extra thing, right? So there's it's it's a, it's a, there's a, there's some interactions that aren't fully captured by these hypotheses. Okay, so here's what I found. There's no, there's um, a negative effect of, or, or sorry, there's a positive effect of having a certificate, but it's not significant. It's a very small um, uptick from in the callback rate. When you look at the differences by for-profit versus not-for-profit, it starts to get interesting because that difference between um, having a certificate and not at the not-for-profit level is significant. So if you have a two-year degree from, say, uh, in Chicago from one of the Chicago City Community Colleges. If you say you have a University of Phoenix online one-year bridge certificate, you actually are getting higher callback rates, which I triple-checked this when I first did the analysis because I didn't understand how this was possible. But it's true that it's something, something is happening where employers see that extra work that you did t potentially towards a bachelor's degree and are valuing that on some level, but only if you already had a not-for-profit degree. Can, I, can you clarify the significance level of those? Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of them you're, you're making inferences, but it looks like they overlap. The, 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 co the confidence interval, the, so that that's a that's a fallacy of the way that the confidence intervals work is that it doesn't, so visually, what, it's not necessarily. significantly different? The not-for-profit, yes, those two are. So, okay. So the difference in difference is also significant? Yeah, uh, yeah it should be, yes, right? So then when you break this out by race, um, I think what's really interesting here is the, essentially the, the difference is happening for both whites and blacks at that not-for-profit level. Um, whereas you can see that uh, African-Americans with the, the for-profit associate degrees are essentially just sort of getting stuck at the bottom of this hierarchy of callbacks, regardless of whether they're getting a certificate or not. Um, but whites and blacks, at the not-for-profit level, these certificates are helping, which is fascinating to me that this thing that doesn't get a lot of press seems like total fake garbage that they're just trying to sell you and get more money from you, um, uh, probably mostly marketed to kids that already got an associate degree from their university, from University of Phoenix Online, but nonetheless, it's still out there for anyone to do. Um, is is sending some signal to employers that that they are valuing, which is the next phase of this is sort of unpacking why this is happening. So in terms of the way that I set up these hypotheses, um, I would say that the, the first, uh, in, in just looking at the credentials, there's evidence of what I call black racialized stigma that the response rates for blacks and whites with the not-for-profit associate degrees are similar, but um, blacks <laughs> receive a penalty compared to whites when they have a for-profit associate's degree. Uh, but there's also this evidence of the signal boost that there are higher response rates for the individuals who get these certificates compared to not, but this is totally driven by those who already had a not-for-profit associate degree 
And it's not doing anything to counteract the existing inequalities. It's just an additive, um, not a multiplicative thing that helps, say, African Americans more. So here's some positives. So compared to both my own and other field experiments, these white-black gaps are lower, regardless of which dimension you're looking at, whether it's the for-profit versus not or just across the board. Um, they're lower gaps. Now, that could be because this is happening further away from the recession than some of the other field experiments, um, which some of my other work that I'm in the process of analyzing suggests that the recession, the post-recession years have reduced the level of discrimination some um, across the board. Um, but it could also be that um, there are differences in the ways that using names and credentials is fuzzing the picture a little more than it's not just a clean, this is about the timing of everything. Um, as much as I hate to say this next sentence, it appears at least that certificates could be worth the investment under certain scenarios. Um, and another positive is that there really doesn't appear to be significant penalties in for whites getting for-profit degrees other than if you think about the ROI. Um, but if, if that's all your only option is, um, maybe it's worth it. Now the negatives. Certificates, um, are all the certificates the same? Because some could be very specialized and in demand versus generic certificates. Yeah, so Did they... Fix, I mean, do you have any coding for what kind of Yeah, so at that stage, the certificates were all pretty generic. Okay. They have expanded them significantly, I guess because they have been very profitable for them. Okay. So at that point, essentially they... They were, they were targeted to mostly sort of business degrees. Like you got a general business degree. Now get this certificate that is um, a specialty in HR or marketing or accounting, right? And it's a one-year accelerated online program okay. that is supposed well, to. Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Were the certificates completed contemporaneously with the degree? Because in that case, it's just telling me this person can do a lot of work over a two-year period. Yeah. It's valuable in that sense. Yeah, so no. So the, the way that this worked was that everybody has a one-year um, employee. So they're, they're com completed contemporaneously with employment, mm -hmm. not with the other degree. So it's not like you did a two-year associates and a certificate simultaneously. You did a two-year certificate, I mean, you did a two-year associates where everybody works for one year, and then um, some people have the certificate or not. So essentially, they're putting in extra hours. So that's probably, that's why I keep coming back to this idea of that you are working to try to improve yourself, even if it's this thing that employers don't fully understand and maybe already have a negative um, stereotype of what that means, but then it's counterbalanced by you, you essentially you worked your ass off, right? You know, you, you tried to do something at night or on the weekends when everyone else was not. Why would that differ by the type of school? That's a good question. I, I wonder if essentially what's happening here is that, so imagine you, what you have, what's maybe hard to realize is that no one employer is seeing this all laid out in front of them, right? Um, and the other, the, the black box of audit studies is that we don't know what the rest of the pool looks like. So it's possible that what's happening is these certificates are, were uncommon enough at that point that employers didn't know what they were. And they see one applicant come in and they're like, you got this two-year Strayer degree and then you got this online um, University of Phoenix degree. It's just everything is sort of scammy. I don't know what's happening with your education here, right? Whereas this other employer sees somebody who's got a certificate and they had, you know, maybe a quote unquote more legitimate two year degree and they've got this other thing on top of it. And so I think it's sort of the, what we're seeing is sort of the interaction of the two certificates in a va or of the two credentials in a vacuum of you don't see other people that also did the other route, right? Because any employer only sees two applicants and they're never gonna see two applicants both with certificates. So the negatives. So um, 
you know, if you think about this outside of the vacuum of the field experiment, the for-profit has a lower return on investment than not-for-profit, particularly for the African-American students, because Strayer is going to cost you almost $30,000 over two years. The City Colleges of Chicago, even if you take a little longer than two years, is still less than $10,000, right? So that's a significant difference in how, how long it's going to take you to recoup your investment on this. On top of that, what I, the, one of the reasons why I talked about Strayer in particular is that these for-profits have specific ad campaigns to target minorities. During the time that this was in the field, Steve Harvey was on TV selling Strayer University um, as a, you know, a place to get your degree and um, move up in the um, labor force. And these ads were pretty, um, um, pretty heavily targeting uh, areas with minorities, uh, TV stations that represented areas with high percentages of minorities during um, uh, 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 minority-focused television programs, et cetera. So they, they had a specific, it was, I was actually looking hard for, the, for someone to actually just come out and specifically say that their advertising campaign was doing it, but they don't use the words, but you can infer from what they've done that that was their, their strategy all along was that they were, they were not trying to specifically target white students, that they were trying to target black students. Um, so, yes. So 